most of them were somewhere between one to five. Um, so they were smaller, not actually. Wow. And then, you know, put a lot of them there. Yeah, there's actually only a total, I think, yes. Um, welcome, everybody, to the third uh, root zone, the root zone, with the dot at the end. Um, and uh, this time we are very honored to have Paul Bixby here. Um, I'll pass the mic over to Dan, to uh, Danny right now to make all the introductions. Uh, but this is the third part of uh, this first series. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the end, but basically we will be hoping to uh, think about the next part, uh, the next series. Uh, so welcome and um, yes. Hey guys. Does this work? Is this, does this happen? Yeah. Okay, okay. You tell me. Um, I, we are so excited to have Paul. Uh, Paul is credited with making DNS usable. Uh, he wrote some of the most widely used DNS software uh, on the internet. Uh, we have a whole bunch of questions for him. Um, hopefully you have questions too. There will be topics here. Uh, take them as light suggestions. Uh, just like uh, throw out questions as you have them. Uh, there should be really um, like uh, informal, um, like when else do you get to ask Paul 60 questions? Uh, so take a good um, There may or may not be questions, the uh, topics here. <laughs> or everything else. Okay. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about is I heard you say this really interesting quote. You said, um, if the internet is a territory, then DNS would be its map. And I'm curious about what you mean by that. So you can, depending on what line of work you're in, you can say that BGP was the map, but I am in the DNS line of work, so to me DNS is what's important. We are typing fewer domain names now. Uh, it used to be that you had to uh, see a billboard on the side of a bus and uh, remember the .com name and go type that into some browser. That's not happening so much anymore, mostly because smartphones make that hard. Uh, we're mostly using search engines, keywords, uh, or we're just clicking on stuff. But all of those interrelationships, everything a search engine can find, anything you can click on to go from one, one web page to another, is still a DNS name. So even though we're seeing them less than we ever saw before, they are what glues everything about the internet that we actually use together. No DNS, no internet. Wouldn't matter what you had if you didn't have DNS to locate things for you. What was your first interaction with DNS? Uh, I was a consultant at Underman Bass in 1986, uh, maintaining their vaxes, and uh, we were using DNS internally. Uh, in '86, most companies didn't have an internet connection, so you just sort of made stuff up. You had to make your own internal root zone, for example. Um, and so I learned DNS the hard way using Vax PSD in 1986. Uh, when did you first think of the protocol? Well, it's, at first, you don't, when you first start to use DNS, you don't think about the protocol so much. Um, you're mostly looking at a zone file or a, a server configuration. Uh, or you're wondering why your ping doesn't work. So um, <laughs> I didn't understand anything about the protocol at first other than, well, clearly, if I can declare this server to be a master or uh, a primary or secondary server, there is clearly some method by, by which content moves between primaries and secondaries, but I didn't know actually about zone transfer until uh, I later on started working on the code itself. Yeah. And, and what point did you work on Bind? I worked at DEC, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation. You may remember them, they made faxes. Um, they were, in 1988, when I joined them, the number two computer company, computer-related company in the world after IBM. Uh, Oracle was still small, Microsoft was small, um, and I went to work there and ran their corporate internet gateway, which would seem small to you these days, but at that time, I had 130,000 employees behind me, and I had this teeny little internet connection in front of me, and I was running the gateway between those. Uh, so I had to run the deck.com zone, and software bind did not work. So since we manufactured operating systems, it was called Ultrix, it was based on DSD, I had the source code, and so I started fixing it. And I found that deck's version of bind was out of date with respect to what Berkeley had released since then. So I grabbed Berkeley's latest version and started fixing that. 
and then, how, and then how did you become officially involved? In those days, DNS was not sexy. There were no companies like this that thought of themselves as being in the DNS business. It was the grungy sort of pipes and steam fittings and uh, toiletry uh, that, that made the network work, but nobody was really particularly interested in it. So once word got out that I was actually patching bind and would be willing to accept patches and publish new tarballs, uh, everybody said, you're the guy, Here, here's, here's my stuff, here's my bug report, uh, how come you haven't fixed that for me? I reported it last week. <laughs> What was the vision of Bind at the time? Like, how was it sold to you? It was the only game server there was. Uh, there, there, was <laughs> there was Jeeves, which Mike Petrus wrote on uh, TOPS, which was DEC's 36-bit operating system, and there it was Bind. Um, so, uh, it was Bind or nothing. So, uh, it wasn't sold to me, it was uh, simply that was the only game server the internet had. And when he started working on it at the time, like, what was the state it was in? It looked as though it had been um, pounded on by a whole bunch of undergraduate monkeys, uh, various generations of folks affiliated with CSRG back at Berkeley, and uh, eventually uh, escaped into a uh, BSD release tape and eventually patched somewhat reluctantly by Mike Carroll's and some and Phil Longquist and some other folks, but it was abandonware and it was some of the crappiest software that I had ever seen. <laughs> Can you talk about like what you did with that? Like, How did you grow this project? Um, so one of the things that was going on back then is that we were getting ANSI C, and um, so we were getting C with prototypes as opposed to C where functions were declared with just open, closed parentheses, and if you called it the wrong number of arguments, then it, you just got what you got. So, um, given that we had some advantages there, I started adding a lot of uh, modern, then modern language features and discovering that there were a number of parts of mine, for example, that were calling each other with four arguments but only receiving three, and sometimes they were the right three, and sometimes they were the wrong three, and so forth. So, just modernizing the code base and taking advantage of some of the software engineering stuff at DAC that Berkeley didn't have. Was, uh, that was the first pass through, and you have to understand, when I started working on the code, I still didn't understand the protocol at all. I worked on the code for two years before I knew what an RFC was or read one. <laughs> so it was so much broken that you didn't even understand the protocol in order to fix that you could just work on a protocol, not a protocol problem. That's awesome. Does anyone have questions somewhere? What were some of the things that DEC had that Berkeley uh, didn't have? I'm repeating just for the live stream. Uh, the question is, what were some of the things that uh, DEC had that Berkeley didn't have? Well, one example is an ANSI compiler. Um, another would be a uh, C interpreter, which I'm trying to remember the name of, uh, where you could actually load, a whole, load the whole thing in and let, the, uh, let a high-level graphic interpreter run the program for you. Again, you'd consider that trivial by today's standards, but it was magic in 1989. What was it like to work on Bind at the time? Um, so, I still feel like I, I lost a bet of some kind because uh, <laughs> my friend Lynn Treese had a job like mine working for DAC, but he was on the East Coast working in the Cambridge Research Lab. I was in the Palo Alto Western Research Lab. And I thought I remembered a deal where I was going to take care of Sendmail and he was going to take care of Bind. And it ended up that I ended up taking care of both of them. <laughs> so, I had a little bit of a victim mentality there. But eventually, um, after I understood the protocol and sort of saw uh, how important it was to networks that were bigger than one building, which we were just coming into vogue at the time, uh, it was tremendously exciting. I remember the first feature I ever added to Bind was the ability to control zone transfer. And again, that's trivial to you guys now, all name servers have that ability, but there was no ACL concept. Uh, the concept was, if, if I have a zone, it is fetchable. And there were no firewalls at the time either. Um, so adding that and realizing that I could actually add a feature over here that everybody would fetch the tarball, including other vendors and so forth, and I could just uh, expand the DNS experience for the whole internet was really exciting. And how many people were using Bind at the time? All of them. 
There was nothing else. <laughs> so, uh, as Bike was growing, how did the culture of the project grow, like, change and develop? How did working on the project change? Um, so, as it, uh, as it got out there, uh, a lot of people started wanting to add uh, sort of different enterprise type features to it. In fact, Dex version of Bind had all kinds of Kerberos permissions in it because they were using Kerberos in a lot of their enterprise software. Um, and all of that was crap. Uh, but there was at one time uh, uh, Mike Schwartz in Colorado, UC Boulder, had added um, some different data types uh, to support PESI a little better. Although the MIT people have added a bunch of things for NC. And between the two of them, we have a bunch of non-standard RR types. There was at one time in the mind code base something called the UID record and the GID record and so forth. This is stuff we would use TXT for today, but at that time, no one really understood that someday Bind would be in the minority and there'd be a lot of other name servers and a lot of different implementations and that anything that wouldn't interoperate at that time in the future was worthless. You shouldn't develop it now if it's not going to interoperate in the future. They didn't do that. So there were a lot of uh, just local research ideas that got added to Bind and I'm sending them to me as patches and saying, I want this because it supports my customers in some way. And I kept saying no. Uh, eventually, I didn't know what an RFC was, and I started telling people, you get an RFC approved, I'll take a patch. You don't, I won't. It's really interesting. Something that I'm curious about is, uh, Bind went from version 4 to version 8. Uh, what happened to version 5, 6, and 7? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm assuming that everybody here knows what Git is and either loves it or hates it, but there's no middle ground. Um, it used to be that there was something called CVS, and CVS was based on something called RCS, and RCS was written as an open uh, sort of alternative to SCCS. So SCCS was part of the programmer's workbench, came from uh, Unix Systems Laboratories, and for its time it was pretty good. Again, compared to nothing, which was the alternative. <laughs> so anyway, uh, for file version numbers in those days did not have an unlimited number of tuples. So in RCS or CBS, you could easily have you know, version 1.2.3.4.5.6 of some file. And uh, indeed, you could compare it left to right and you know, figure out which file was more recent by looking at various tuples. Um, SCCS had exactly two. It was the major and the minor. And so that meant that any time you wanted to do a new uh, vendor branch, is what we call it today, in SCCS, you had to increment the major number. And the major number of uh, BSD 4.2 was 4. The major number of BSD 4.3 was 5, and so forth and so forth. And by the time I got around to it, the major number that they were using in SCCS at BSD, or back in CSRG, was 8. That corresponded, I guess, to 4.3 Reno or 4.4 Light 1 or something. I don't know exactly what they were on, but they were at 8. And Sendmail had jumped from version 5 to version 8. And I realized that in order that this continued to be a logical, fair descendant of BSD, I had to move to version 8. Sorry, you asked it. <laughs> Why did you? Good question. At the time you were doing this, were you um, predicting down the road, long down the road, major problems? And, and you know, did, did you eventually get to the points where you were looking back and saying, aha, I totally called it? Um, can you repeat the question? He wants to know if I was. Uh, able to look down the road and foresee more major problems, and I want to know: Do you mean in the code architecture, the protocol, the community? What specifically? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I understood at that time that um, the certainly by the early '90s when I left DEC, it was clear that uh, the internet was going to be the big thing. And it had not been clear up until that time. There was a big fight about whether it was going to be the OSI protocols, whether we would all be using uh, X.25 and uh, 
HTTP4 and so forth instead of IP and TCP. Um, and it seems, again, so much in, in retrospect, this looks like a stupid argument because the, the, the thing that was uh, being proposed as the alternative was coming out of the telco world and was completely stateful. And it had trouble even keeping up at uh, DS3 speeds. If you were already at OC12 speeds with a stateless core, it was you know, the hardware assist. So the argument looks stupid in retrospect, but there were plenty of CEOs playing golf with other CEOs on the golf course asking the question seriously, should I invest in TCP IP? Uh, to give you an idea, uh, DEC itself, because they had so much business in Europe at that time, decided in uh, 88, 89 time frame to invest in OSI because their telco customers in, uh, the, in Europe were, were beating on that, saying they have to have a production quality OSI protocol stack. And uh, so they did. They called it TechNet Phase 5. And the 5, I think, stood for the number of a billion, that's like a million with a B, dollars that they invested in their OSI. They had the highest quality, top to bottom. They had it on every computer they made. It was documented. It was perfect. It was better than anything you've got today. Better than anything anybody is selling today. I would say to Red Hat, you've done a great job cleaning up Linux, but compared to DeckNet Phase 5, you, didn't, you don't know what you did. But clearly they bet wrong. But a lot of people were wondering which way to bet. Some of them bet wrong. Um, so when I looked down the pike, I saw, okay, IP is going to win. IP TCP is going to win. Uh, UUNet was just getting started. They were starting to sell Alternet, which was commercial IP services instead of just UUCP services. Um, and I can see that this is what everybody in the world is going to be using soon. And this software is terrible, and there's going to be a million bugs. I didn't call the Morris form in particular, but certainly if you think about GetS and connecting it to, to a network socket, you would imagine that the Morris form would become an action. So I was worried, you know, the market forces and laws of physics and so forth are going to lead us toward TCP IP, but no investment is being made there along the lines of what was invested in DECMAN Phase 5, and it's going to be a very chaotic world. So I, I think I was right about that. <laughs> so when you inherited it, or took it over, it, it was a mess, and you cleaned stuff up. Is there anything left in there that you look at and go, oh, that is just terrible, but you can't pull it out because everything else will fall apart? The question is, is there anything left in mind in the versions that you worked on that is still a mess? <coughs> so, find eight is dead. I don't know if you can read my t-shirt from that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But um, it is not quite the same as Apache version 1 being dead, because Apache version 2 was written on the bones of Apache version 1. Shares some code. Um, find 9 does not share code with find 8. And the reason for that is because everything was going in my day. Some part of it said, um, we can't fix that part, let's start over. It's the, uh, the reason. Have you ever had an old car where um, I don't know, the alternator dies, and so you replace it because the rest of the car is fairly new, and then the starter dies, and you replace it again? So you keep doing that, eventually the motor will die, and you'll say, I cannot afford that. Well, um, with Bind, it was the other way around. Everything went bad at once. Everything wore out at the same time. So we were just able to abandon it on the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> so the worst architectural defect of Bind 8 um, was that it, it was a pretty straightforward uh, implementation of DNS as explained in RFC 1034 and 1035, which meant that it had one name tree and it represented zone cuts as data within that tree, and it was a server that could answer both recursively and authoritatively using a common database. And the RFCs describe this and try to get around all of the different corner cases where you don't know what bit you should set in your response and so forth. And Bind was attempting to be a faithful implementation of this, and it was not. Uh, you can't really do it, as it turns out. So Bind 9, has a tree of zone cuts uh, that it looks at first to see if there's authoritative data, and then it has a different tree of recursive data, and it has one of those, a 
a set of each of those per view. So once you've chosen a view, you can decide if you have authority data, and if you don't, you go to the recursive. Find A didn't have that separation, and so it was pretty easy to craft a packet, even on the latest, greatest, last ever to be shipped version of Find A, you could craft a response packet uh, that would pollute authority data uh, because it was stuff that was present in some recursive packet. Um, and the, there was no fixing it. It just could not be fixed. You can't put those different kinds of data into a single data structure and have it come out right. There were also reference counting bugs that would cause it to dump poor, but uh, that wasn't as bad as this defect. Uh, you mentioned implementing the first ACL for bind, uh, which is probably the start of the race of not making Euler DNS some files bubble. Then get the NSSEC making the NSSEC record that's already exposed to all the zone again, and then get NSSEC 3, and then now we have white lies. Uh, do you still think it's a good idea to put secret data in the zone file, or should you have internal DNS servers? Or how do you approach that problem today? The question is uh, is it still a good idea to put secret data in the zone file? Um, short answer is no. Um, but the longer answer is, uh, you know, if you don't want people to get at something, then obscurity about the name you gave it is probably not going to protect you very much. Because uh, maybe NSEC will come along and let them zone walk it, or maybe the, the name will be uh, simply observed in transit or found in, at rest in a mail school or something like that. So unless you can keep the name secret, then keeping the content secret is a fool's errand. Um, and if you're going to keep the name search secret, why are you using the DNS? Um, but the truly odd case is uh, split horizon or uh, views. If you want to have enterprise data that probably corresponds to a whole bunch of network 10 addresses and other things that are simply not reachable from the internet, and it wouldn't make sense if they were reachable from the internet, um, then you, you're probably going to want to keep that uh, reach so that the DNS assets that would point into your version of Net 10 are not reachable outside of your version of Net 10. And that turns out to be very hard to get right. Uh, so even in that case, uh, you should really not put something new into a zone file if you wouldn't like to see it on the front page of tomorrow's new newspaper. Why ultimately did you decide to leave working on Vine? So um, when I was working at DAC, um, my management was uh, highly tolerant. Uh, I think they expected some minimal amount of cooperation from me, and as long as they got that, then they didn't really mind what else I was doing. And that's how I was working on Vine. Nobody told me at DAC, by the way, you should fix this. They said, all you're in charge of the corporate gateway, and I found that this was broken, so I started working on it. Um, eventually, I left DAC, and I discovered that uh, no one was paying me for anything, and that I should fix that. Uh, so, <laughs> contracting, and the people I was contracting with uh, were strangely uh, uninterested in also funding work on time. So it just went fallow for a while. People kept sending me bug reports um, because they knew it was me, and I took the mailing list with me just kind of as a public service. And it was a very, very much a barn raising atmosphere in, the, in those days. Uh, and I did push out one version, uh, 4.9.4. Uh, but I didn't work at DAC anymore, so I couldn't copyright it as DAC. So I had to copyright it as Big Enterprises. And I thought, this is wrong. This is essentially me stealing from the community. I should be able to copyright it as somebody who's giving it away. I'm giving it away, but it still looks like uh, privatization of what used to be a public asset. And uh, so I called Rick, the founder of UUNet, um, and I said, gee, I'd like to work on Bind. Uh, where would I get the money? He said, well, we'll pay you some minimal amount of money if you just you know, keep pushing out versions. And that was how Bind got maintained for a while. But uh, Rick and I founded Internet Systems Consortium, not to be the company it is now. It's got 40 or 50 employees and does all kinds of important stuff. We founded it so that we could copyright Bind under the name of a 501c3. Um, and so uh, that went along for a while until the rest of the community got up to speak with the fact that this internet thing was going to be big after all. And 
folks would come to me and say, hey, there's this new feature in DNS, there's an RFC about it, um, how much would it cost us to pay you to implement it? And that was how I got back into working online and being paid at the same time. And what do you think of Bind's progress since you left? Well, so I uh, worked on Bind 4.8.3 uh, or so, up through 8. Uh, whatever the last one was. And I can see that it needed a complete rewrite. And we gathered, fund we did the fundraising. Jerry Scharf came as the um, executive director of IOC at that time to do some fundraising. And we raised some money to go write what we were calling by nine. And um, I made the edict. Not one line of code is to make the, make the job from by date. By date can be used as an example so you can figure out what the features are because they're not well documented. Look at the source code all you want, but don't copy it. And I did not want to do any of that work myself. I was somewhat in love with this fractured thing called Bind 8, and I knew that I couldn't write something that wouldn't look an awful lot like it. So I hired other people to do that and used the community's money to pay them. And that started probably 98 or so, and we got it running by 2001 or so. And like all about zero versions of anything, uh, it sucked. Bind 9 was a pig. And had Bugs. It was slow. It was it was terrible, um, and it took a couple of years until I ended up two or so before it was really safe to run. And certainly, uh, no version earlier than nine point two ran on any name server because it was too slow. So they were all still running by date, um, and eventually we got our, got it to the point where by nine could do everything by date could do at the same speed or faster if it was a multiprocessor and. Uh, and that's when they published this t-shirt, let everybody know, by the is dead, stop using it. <laughs> and uh, I, so I stopped working on Bind, other than the, all of the versions of Bind 8, until about 9.2, because we were releasing both at once, and I didn't want to ask anybody else to work on 8. So even though I was the president of the company, I was the only one working on Bind 8 at that time. Um, but I, you know, once Bind 8 was done, I stopped working on, on DNS code for the most part. Uh, I stayed at ISC for an additional 10 years working on other stuff, but uh, for me, mine then ended with mine. What did you learn running and building mine? I think you mean, what did I learn running and building ISC? Because uh, uh, everybody knows what it's like to run an AIM server. Um, certainly building bind um, is an exercise in real-time programming. I remember the first uh, Usenics where there was any real mention of threads. Uh, somebody made a t-shirt that said, programming the threads is like having bees buzzing around inside your head. Um, and that is largely true. Threads make everything harder. Um, but uh, it certainly teaches you that um, you know, asynchrony is hard, and you can you know, pay up front or you can pay on the back side. One way or another, you've got context switch overhead. Um, I learned to despise the UDP implementation of all uh, Unix-based kernels. Uh, I really like the msend concept that Linux eventually came up with, where you could uh, move more than one packet across the user kernel boundary in a single syscall. Um, because other than that, the only, only way you can get reasonable UDP performance is to implement it in BPF and actually do your own user node UDP implementation, and that is that's terrible. So I learned that kernel people are, uh, like everybody, to solve the problems they have and push everything else on your side of the line. So uh, you founded ISC, and it was this like very exciting time. Uh, the root zone was being established, and uh, ISC got a root zone. Uh, how did this play out? Like, how did this So it happened in stages. Um, ISC ended up operating a name server called Fruit, and is still operating that name server. It wasn't originally called Fruit. This idea of using the letter names came later from Bill Manning's innovation, um, and it saved us some space in the packets so we could fit our name servers. But um, originally, it was called ns.isc.org. And um, what happened was, I had. Uh, left deck 
And people were wondering, does that mean that Pine is now back to being abandoned where? And I thought, no, I'll patch it and so forth. Um, and I was getting some bug reports from root name server operators who were using you know, Pine 4 on their uh, root server. And that itself was an innovation because while I was still at DEC, I fixed a bug in Bind 4 that had made it unable to host a root zone. It used to be that the data structures, uh, the recursive hash table and so forth, start, started at the wrong half step, and so you couldn't actually have an authority zone that had no labels in the name. So I fixed that back at DEC, and then later I was still getting bug reports from the people running that code who were switching away from the tops. 20 version of the 36-bit genes written in Pascal that Dr. Petrus had left them. Um, and uh, I, I finally called Postel, who was alive then, and said, John, uh, I think it would be easier for me to support these people if I was running a group name server myself. And he said, hmm, seems like a reasonable idea. And he sent email to various people and uh, made it so. So, um, we named it in isc.org rather than fix.com. It's another good reason why we had to have a nonprofit company there. Um, and it, uh, it, it was originally a single server. It's a 486DX2 running at 66 megahertz. It had probably 64 meg of RAM and two 1 gig SCSI hard drives, Seagate SCSI 1 hard drives. And it was fine because we were getting, you know, maybe a thousand queries a second at that time. This was 1994, 95 time frame. Um, no, 90, yeah, 95, 96, something like that. Um, eventually, we had to replace it with much bigger servers, and eventually, we needed more than one server for failover, and then we needed it for load balancing, and then we needed multiple locations so that we could do global anycast uh, as a substitute for load balancing. So it, 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 there's a certain progression to you, you know, put your foot uh, on, on the rail, you have to follow where it goes. Uh, but originally it was uh, just so that I could have direct experience with using Bind as a root name server so that I could support the other root name server operators who were doing so. What were the early days of maintaining a root like? At that time, it wasn't just the root. Uh, we also handled com, net, or in there about ARPA, ARPA, and there were like seven or eight different infrastructure zones that were in all of these. And, and of course, now we've got uh, thousands of GTLDs and VeriSign runs the comm servers for themselves and so forth. But at that time, no one foresaw any of that. It was just, you know, it, these are infrastructure zones. It's the ugly uh, plumbing of the internet. Somebody's got to run it, and we know just who's going to do it, which are the same volunteers who are taking care of the route. So it was all voluntary. There's no money in it. Um, it was uh, it was fine until Com started to grow. Uh, and the, the other zones didn't grow nearly as fast as Com. But when Com got above, I don't know, uh, say a hundred thousand no, when it got above about five hundred thousand names, my little sixty-four megabyte server was no longer able to hold it all in memory. That, that, that was the kind of problem we had with them. Um, and so. Other than just coping with the growth of COM, there wasn't a lot to do in the early years. Eventually, we moved COM, that board, all the other crap off to other servers, uh, partly for political reasons, uh, because the people who care about the DNS route are terrified of complexity. And, uh, and so it's very simple now, it's a single, single zone. Um, but uh, Back then, there were no politics and there were no politicians. We all just sort of did it because it had to get done, and we were the ones doing it. And for root zone operators, what sort of problems would you encounter in those days? Like, what sort of questions would they have? Uh, well, the problems I would encounter would be things like I just ran out of memory, or I just ran out of disk space because COM kept growing and I wasn't ready for it. Um, and the questions I got from other people were things like, uh, I remember one day, uh, the, this is not during VeriSign's or Network Solutions times, so before then, uh, after SRI NIC, there was this company, uh, Government Services International or something, that won the contract away from SRI, and uh, they didn't have enough output bandwidth. The, their DS3 was full, and so they were timing out trying to publish the, that day's version of the comm zone 
and everybody was freaking out because their comm zone was from yesterday and it was going to expire if they didn't get it, uh, get, get a fresh copy. So we were FTPing it to each other. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do a few people know? Or like, what would surprise people about running a route? Uh, the thing that, the last surprise I had uh, was the number of DDoS attackers who are using the root name servers as part of their uh, reflecting amplifier system. Um, so, my trailing years at ISC, I hired somebody else to be the CEO, and I was just the chairman and chief scientist, and I was once again thinking technical thoughts, which was fun, although it was hard at first. Um, and I decided to take a look at response rate limiting, uh, because if somebody wants to use your name server as a reflecting amplifier, all they're going to do is send a stream of small queries and you will answer the apparent source of those queries with a bunch of large answers, especially with DNSSEC, especially if it's a negative response in DNSSEC, which will include three proofs. Um, so um, you can tell this is happening because your network bandwidth chart goes through the roof and might flatline. If you have a one gig output port on that server, you might see that all of a sudden, hey, I've been sending exactly one gig all day. And most of that is, is attack traffic, and a fair amount of the non-attack traffic is not making it out because your output port is full. But um, as I studied the problem, uh, the surprise was it wasn't that it was a periodic attack uh, where somebody was flatlining your output port. It was constant attack of all sizes from all sources against all uh, victims. So this business of uh, DDoS amplification through DNS goes back at least a decade, and it's, uh, it's responsible for most of the traffic that the routes see. So we developed something called DNS RRL, response rate limiting. Uh, I know I've had a conversation with you on the blog about that, um, that tries to guess whether a given question should really be repeating this, this often. And it's just looking, it's, you know, blowing the questioners together into slash 24s or slash 48s or 56s if it's at 56. And it's uh, making buckets that correspond to SOA records and counting the negatives and the positives and so forth. And we found two things that were very interesting. One, it's amazingly accurate. You, you can actually, without spending very much RAM or very many CPU cycles, you can accurately say this is part of an attack and that's not. And you can preferentially answer the part that's not and drop the part that is, and no one will complain and say I'm getting timeouts because no, ra no correct traffic gets dropped. So that was the first surprise, is that it was actually possible without much trickery. There's no machine learning, there's no deep learning, there's no alpha go, there's nothing fancy like that. You know, this is, uh, this is punch card level technology. Um, and the second was just that how many low grade attacks are in progress all the time using all the servers. The internet is, you may think, looking at your Facebook feed, that the internet is mostly crap, but I'm telling you, it's mostly crap. <laughs> so you, you've spoken a lot about this in the past. What are some of your pet problems going on right now, and uh, what are some solutions you see? The question is, what are the pet problems going on right now, and what are the solutions? In 1999, uh, Dan Sini and Paul Ferguson wrote an RFC that was later enshrined as a BCP, BCP number 38, and it talked about how uh, sending a packet using somebody else's source address would cause them to receive the response and that this was bad and that when the packets come into your network from your edge, like from a server or from a customer, or basically they're making the transition from ISO layer 2 to ISO layer 3, you want to look at the IP source address and see if it is reasonable for where the packet actually came from. And if it's not, you should drop it. Um, this RFC did not have a lot of impact. Uh, Cisco, for example, um, where both of these guys worked, or no, Ms. Ferguson worked at the time, um, added what they call RPF, reverse path something check-in, um, but they didn't make it the default. And most people are just buying Cisco and 
I get you know, the cardboard's in the way. Get that cardboard out of the way. Okay, now rack, screw it into the rack. Okay, power it up. Okay, let's go home. Um, so it wasn't having much impact. So in 2002, when the ICANN Security and Stability Committee, which I was a charter member, um, decided to uh, you know ask around, well, what's the biggest problem on the internet? We should write something as our first major report, and uh, it should be something that's important to security and stability. And I said, hey, I, I know something, uh, which was the source address validation matter. And what was interesting is that nobody else on the, uh, the SSAC that day knew what it was. They didn't know this was a problem. That's how big a problem it was. These guys were the brain trust, and they didn't know. So we wrote a report, uh, SAC 004, and it's got my name on it, and it's written uh, and published in ASCII. I'm very proud of it. It's a four-page document. It is about half the size of PCP38. It says about the same thing, but without the charts, without the diagrams, and without asking the reader to understand how anything works. So it was, in Dilbert terms, the pointy-haired boss version of PCP38. And so uh, we published it in 2002. And uh, since I travel quite a bit and speak fairly often as a keynote speaker, I started talking about this, and if I was talking about something else, I would fold this in, or I would add on to the end, by the way. Uh, and 10 years later, I don't know where the SSAC was meeting, but it was some ICANN meeting in some hot, sticky place. And we were sitting in the SSAC meeting, and I had noticed it was the 10-year anniversary of the publication of SAC 04. And uh, so I said, hey, uh, anybody want to hold a week? What do you mean? Well, it's dead, clearly. We've been flogging it for 10 years. The internet has tripled in size however many times, and the problem has gotten nothing but worse. No matter how hard we flog this idea, people still allow source addresses to come into their network that have not been validated in any way. So I guess that's my biggest pet peeve. Um, it's not the thing that scares me the most, which would be the uh, so-called internet of so-called things. <laughs> we are about to add a whole bunch of low-cost uh, microprocessors that either can or cannot be field patched. You can pick which thing you're more, most afraid of for me, it's either. Um, <laughs> and the total cost of each one of them is going to be less than a nickel. And the total amount of money that they spent red teaming them before they go out or um, uh, doing any kind of QA is going to be so close to zero that the difference is not worth mentioning. And we're going to manufacture them by the tens of billions, and they are going to dictate our future. Uh, the companies who are going to produce these devices and are going to produce the appliances that use these devices are not going to know what a CERT is or what a CERT advisory is. They're not going to know what uh, responsible disclosure means. They're not going to have the source code to their own product. They're not going to continue to have a business relationship with whoever last did have the source code to that product. Uh, so if you report a bug, they're not going to, they won't have a list of their customers. They won't be able to tell the customers that there is a problem. Or they will, and they'll be a social networking company, and they won't be prepared to protect PII. So they can either be a software company that doesn't know how to protect software, or a social company, a social media company that doesn't know how to protect PII. Either way, that's all of them. That's the entire economy, because your choice is to be one of those companies or have your assets bought out of bankruptcy by one of those companies, and we know what people are going to choose. So that even though source address validation should have killed us all by now, uh, it hasn't, but this other thing probably will. <laughs> so you're working on a really interesting project, which is uh, an alternative root server. Uh, can you tell us about that? I can, but I have to start by disputing your question. Um, so the namespace that we have come to uh, to, to know with com and net and org and um, .xyz and so forth uh, is operated by ICANN under the auspices of something called IANA which is a contract that is partly controlled by IETF or ISOC and partly controlled by the U.S. government. There's a lot of work going on right now to change who the IANA reports to because having the U.S. government in that role kind of makes the rest of the world worry some that maybe the U.S. government would 
use that as leverage in some diplomatic or political or economic struggle. Um, but it doesn't really matter to, for the purposes of this. The IANA is a namespace. Um, now that namespace includes a delegation to say that .xyz has some name servers and here are their names. And .com has some name servers and here are their names. And ultimately you have to find out the addresses that go with those name server names to actually know where to go for a .xyz lookup and so forth. This is happening all the time. Um, and all of that information to me is the IANA namespace and the small matter of who the root name servers are that you would go to to ask questions about the IANA namespace uh, is not part of the root zone, it's metadata. Uh, it would be like, all, more like a file name than the contents of the file. So, uh, you're referring to something called Yeti, Y-E-T-I, the Yeti DNS project. Um, that is an exploration of IPv6 only name service. Uh, we wanted to do network science. We wanted to actually build a global network that wasn't in a test lab and had a whole bunch of different people who couldn't possibly be sharing code or config samples or you know, similar types of computers or whatever. We wanted them all to run a v6 only uh, version of the root zone. And we wanted people who were willing to live with that to try these out in their test labs and, and see what would happen. Could we actually make the root zone available without any IPv4 service, server addresses? We did not, however, change the namespace. .xyz points exactly where it's supposed to, .com points where it's supposed to, and there are no extras. So it is, it has absolute fealty to the IANA namespace and is not, in that sense, an alternate route at all. Because historically, an alternate route occurs when somebody wants to make money selling names that end in things that don't exist, and so they create a version of the IANA namespace that has some additions. Uh, they might even take make some changes and say, I don't like where .com wants to, I'm going to it at my own servers so that I can data mine it or something like that. Those people are, are doing alternate routes. I'm not doing an alternate route. Uh, I'm doing an alternate root science fair project that is designed to answer some very strict questions about what what is the future of v6 with regard to, to this networking. And we have uh, 30 or so operators that are cooperating with us, and uh, we have a list of other experiments that people want to try. Uh, like, what if we change the uh, key signing key, which has never been changed in the IANA zone? Uh, what if we changed it every week? Uh, does RFC 5011 really work in, in, in a large test bed full, full of people who don't even speak a common language? We're going to test all of those. We're going to do network science. But it's not an alternate group. So you said earlier, like, not storing secrets in like, a zone file, for example. How do you feel about TLDs keeping their zone file secret? The question is, how do you feel about TLDs keeping those own files secret? So, uh, one of the rarely sung heroes of the DNS revolution is a man named Florian Weimar, who invented the concept of passive DNS, although he called it uh, passive DNS logging. Um, and he was working on a master's thesis at Uni Stuttgart, and in 2006 he published a thesis on it. And um, in his front matter, where he described why he chose this topic area for his research, he said, I am a German citizen, and for all the years until this year, the .de zone was considered public information available to any German citizen, and this year they changed it. So I decided to focus my research on passive DNS, which would allow me to reconstruct the .de zone one response at a time and restore the status quo. So think of this, this is what a civil libertarian sounds like in Europe. Um, and, and my current company, Farsight, has taken his basic ideas and built a whole empire out of it. So I, I could talk about passive DNS all night. But um, I think he was right. I think that these, uh, the top of the namespace is a public asset. 
And just as we supposedly give the public the ability to help select the ICANN board, who then turns around and selects, you know, how do we decide whether or not XYZ can be created and so forth, we're, we're saying that there's public input to the DNS because we're saying the DNS is a public resource. And I believe that that should be considered true of every TLD. Um, and ICANN largely agrees in that the generic uh, TLDs, the ones that ICANN actually has contractual authority over, are required to make themselves available. Maybe not publicly, not directly, but it's, there can be no charge. And if you send the appropriate mail to the appropriate mailbox at Verisign, you can get a .com zone, and you won't have to pay for it. You will have to sign various things indicating that you want them to make it freely available to other people who haven't you know, made the same promises, but that's, I think that's fair. Um, the difficulty comes in with the country code TLDs, because these country codes are, legally speaking, the, the property of sovereign nations. And ICANN does not have a contractual ability to compel these people to do anything. And so I think they should make their zone files available. Uh, and most of them do, some of them don't. And it bothers me that some of them don't, because those are all public resources as far as I, I see that. And let me take that further. I would like to see some kind of a feed. Uh, zero and Q would be fine. Uh, RSS would be fine, whatever it is. So that any time a change is made to one of those files, when a new delegation point is created in .xyz, I keep looking at that t-shirt, I would like that to show up on an RSS feed so that everybody in the world can see, ah, you know, foodbar.xyz just got created so that everybody in the world can decide how they feel about that. It might be that this is a brand infringement, or it may be that it is something that is about to be used in uh, phishing attacks in spam, or targeted phishing, or whatever. And I think that the changes that we make, either changing the name servers to redelegate something, or to create a delegation point for the first time, are also public information and should be available to the public in some somewhat controlled way. I don't want spammers getting in and being able to send spam to every new, new domain and so forth, but uh, who is, same deal. If you make a change to who is, I think there should be a real-time change communicated to the world to say, hey, it's your internet, this is what we're doing with it. That's what a civil libertarian sounds like in California. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite TLD? Or like favorite TLD? The question is, what is your favorite TLD? <laughs> so, this is corny, but um, .su. <laughs> I sold VIX.com and bought a Mazda Miata with, uh, with the proceeds, <laughs> which pleased me no end. And I moved my, uh, my, my personal stuff, I have an immense amount of DNS related crap at my house, to uh, VIX.su because I was born in 1963, and in, as late as 1968-69, we were still doing duck and cover drills in our public schools. We were pulling down the shades and climbing under our desks because that was what we needed to practice in case of the uh, atomic war, like that was gonna save us. But um, when you grow up that way, and then you see, in 89, you see the, the, the wall come down, and then you get a chance, as an American, to buy property in the Soviet Union. You do it. <laughs> I was also very proud the day we put an F root Anycast instance into Moscow. Um, and it was highly controversial. I got calls from all kinds of folks. Uh, why are you doing this? Whose permission did you have? It's like, you know, it's just Russia. You can fly there commercially. You know, they're on the internet, you can ping them. Yeah, why are you freaking out? The war's over. Um, so you had answered this at a previous meetup, but I just wanted to ask it again. Why don't domain names have underscores? Why don't domain names have underscores? <laughs> Apparently because I'm a fascist. Most <laughs> often. <laughs> The problem was send mail, like usual back then. It used to be send mail was the big problem for CERT advisories. And I'm responsible for several of them. Well, Eric was a great lead, by the way, so you can't blame him for everything that went wrong there. But um, 
it turned out that if there was a new line character embedded in a PTR, that SendMail would blindly write that into the, the queue control file. And so if you made a PTR record that um, would have some host name ending in .com with a new line, and then the next, whatever followed the new line would be a valid line in a queue control file, uh, then you could essentially write anything you wanted into other people's mail spools, including, I want you to run as UID zero, and I want errors to be piped to this arbitrary command, and by the way, here's a mistake, so why don't you pipe? And the body would go into it. So it was, it was a, kind of a cool hack in a lot of ways. So you'd think that SendMail or Libc or somebody would have looked at that PTR result and said, you know, it's got unprintable characters in the middle of it. I probably don't want that. But the problem was uh, we couldn't fix SendMail fast enough. I mean, the patching SendMail was easy. Uh, publishing the cert advisory was easy. But uh, getting everybody in the world to update their SendMail binary was not easy, and it was a much smaller world than today. So um, they came to me, Mark Tracker, from, who was then at CMU CERT, said, uh, Paul, if you publish a patch to the libc, because I was responsible for get post by name and get post by adder, uh, if you publish a, a patch, we can get all the vendors to update their libc, and we will catch the unprintable character in Lucy and SendMail will never see it. And I said, that's bullshit. <laughs> but I'll do it. <laughs> and so then I, I sat and thought, all right, is it unprintable? Is that the problem? Uh, what else could be there? You know, could dollar sign expansion, back ticks, you know, is it, is, should I only allow alphanumerics? What should I allow? What should I, what should I not allow? And uh, finally, I looked at various RFCs, like the one for uh, the RFC 952 about post.txt. I looked at the RFC for mail, for SMTP names, what's valid in a hello header, that kind of thing. And I found that there is kind of a bright center to what a host name is supposed to look like. And so I just said, those are the rules. If the PTR doesn't match the rules of the host name, According to host.txt and RFC 821 and 822 and so forth, then I'm going to blast it. Uh, I'm not going to let it through. Turns out none of those things allowed underbars. And underbar is the only thing anybody's ever complained about. Nobody ever said, Paul, how come I can't put a comma into my PTR <laughs> name? But underbar is where they deal. Uh, dashes are allowed, but not underbars. And so basically, people would, were asking me. Don't follow the RFCs, do what we're telling you. And I had already decided 15 years earlier that I wasn't going to do that. So I told him, you write an RFC that describes what a host name is, I'll follow it. But if you just want me to change it, then I won't. And so anyway, everybody thinks I hate the underbar. I don't. I just wanted there to be some rule. And I decided that rather than having a list of things I wouldn't allow, I would have a a list of things I would allow, and that I would let someone else, that is the IETF, define what that was. So, uh, I'm innocent. I may be a fascist, but <laughs> I'm not this. That's awesome. Wait, question in the back? Yeah. So, do you, uh, what do you think the email server is like most, most fixed? And actually, you have a favorite email server, and I'm like, right, are you going to speak about email security tonight? Are we going to speak about it? a little bit, but we touched on it. Yeah, the question is, are we going to speak about email security? Uh, that, that, that's the next thing. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite email? Oh, and what's your favorite email client server? Yeah, yeah server. Server? Um, as much as I love SendMail and Eric, and as much as I have added a lot of code to SendMail and wrote a book about SendMail, I'm running Postfix. <laughs> <laughs> And that means that every FreeBSD VM I build, which comes with SendMail on the base system, for some reason I can't imagine, I have to go in and turn it all off. And, um, the, uh, the, it really is just a matter of um, you know, what's keeping current and what has the best anti-spam control. So Milter was developed by Eric for SendMail, but uh, has been taken very far by everybody else. And uh, there's all kinds of things you can do in Postfix to reject uh, bad things from stupid places that uh, I thought I'd like to use. So, Paul, you started the first anti-spam company. How did you get interested in email spam? Well, um, at 
my age, it's somewhat uh, statistically likely and actually true that I take beta blockers. Beta blockers is a pill that you can take that uh, basically makes um, uh, adrenaline not work very well, but it's blood, blood pressure control. Now, post uh, beta blockers, I probably would not have invented the, the RDL and started the first one. <laughs> but pre beta blockers, <laughs> the of my life, I was at a constant risk of waking up angry about something. And um, when I started to see unsolicited uh, bulk commercial unwanted crap email, uh, I did the math and I said, you know, the, the reason that there is a limit to the amount of email that gets stuffed into my paper mailbox, the thing that the U.S. Postal Service uh, is responsible for, is that it costs money to buy the paper, buy the ink, print it, and get it delivered. And it might be de minimis, might be that they get it down to a penny or something like that, but they still have to do a tiny bit of research to find out if there's any possibility ever that somebody at my house is going to want to buy whatever it is they're advertising. Um, with email, none of that is true. The, the recipient has all the costs. And so I remember the day I got uh, an email survey that was sent to everybody in the US database, and I just went off on the student who had sent it, and he referred me to his professor who said, this is valid humanities research. Why are you complaining? Why are you scaring my students? And I went off on him. And look, that email is in Jeff Mulligan's book, uh, so you can, you can find the email I sent back in the 90s saying, uh, you can't do this. You know, you, by sending an email like you just did, you are helping establish a, the wrong answer to the questions that you're studying, which is that this kind of bulk email is, is acceptable. Um, so basically, I just saw it all coming, and one day, uh, I think it was uh, Sanford Wallace, and then thrown off an ISP again for spamming again. Uh, he just went to jail, by the way, for two years. So that would be fun, but that would be out. Um, but anyway, back in the, in the 90s, he, uh, he said, you know, I'm tired of being thrown off of ISPs. I, 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 I want to send this. I've got, I'm saying, his domain name was savetrees.com. He was convinced that people would think he was an environmentalist because he was not cutting down trees to send us advertising. Anyway, so he developed uh, this idea called the Bandwidth Partners Program, where uh, if you signed up for this, he would pay for you to have a T1 link installed from, I don't know where it was, Sprint or whatever. Uh, he would cause a T1, a 1.5 megabit uh, digital internet service to be installed, and all you had to do in order to get that free T1 was to be willing to host a PC for him. And so he was going to use PCs all over the place. He was going to basically give us so many places that we would have to block it from that we would give up. Uh, didn't know us very well. Um, <laughs> so I said, cool, because every one of these things is going to have to illuminate itself by sending spam. And as it does, I am going to add a null route for the slash 24 that it came from. And I'm only going to make that uh, I will allow anybody who wants to take a BGP feed from me containing those null routes to do so free of cost. And um, so he did. He set up his bandwidth partners program and I kept listing them and I found other things to list as well that were also dedicated spam, spam sources and people were beating my door down to get that BGP thing set up. Uh, I, I could have charged for it. I could have charged any amount of money. Um, Eventually, we extended it. Eric Zegast came up with a way to uh, make it uh, so that you didn't have to speak BGP to get the benefit. That you could actually just make your send mail uh, do a lookup, and that's the RBL and DNS as we all know it today. Uh, but anyway, it all started because I woke up angry that somebody was going to uh, try and make spam unstoppable. Uh, now, I want to plead guilt here. Uh, I should not have done this because I caused spam to have a relatively soft insertion force into human culture. I slowed it down enough that you, you and your parents, and your managers, and your boards of directors, and your investors all got used to it. If I had done nothing, 
it would have gotten so sharply bad so quickly that we would actually have a real anti-spam law, not just can spam bullshit. We would have it in every country, and spammers would be in jail. And maybe in some countries, uh, you know, chop their sin finger off. <laughs> so, really, I started the first anti-spam company, and I'm sorry. <laughs> And you ended up learning that an enormous amount of spam comes from domain registers within less than a day ago? That was uh, years later. Uh, what we have found is uh, most domain names are uh, created and then never used, or they're created and they're taken down within a few minutes, or they're created, used for a few minutes, and then uh, abandoned after a three-day waiting period. Uh, so the, the vast majority of new domains, we see two new delegation points per second in our Pasadena system, and that's, that's the right order of magnitude. I've probably only seen half of the names, or a little more than half, but that's, I'm not, not seeing you know, the, the hundred of the names. So of those delegation points, most of them won't be there ten minutes later. Uh, so the simple expedient we have at the moment is a, a response policy zone feed well, not newly observed domains that just tracks that 10 minute window. It sends an update every second to add that second's new domains and to delete the ones that are now more than 10 minutes old. And if you subscribe to that in your recursive name server so that you just won't, um, will not resolve any name that was first observed at Farsight in the last 10 minutes, it turns out you won't be resolving most names because most of them won't live longer than 10 minutes. And that's pretty cool. That's cool. Um, what legal encounters did you end up in trying to stop spam? So, um, like everybody, I had heard of something called the Sherman Antitrust Act, but I had not had it read to me by a lawyer until after I started the first anti spam company. Um, so, with can spam, it is slightly less than kosher to send some forms of spam, but in general, it's legal. Whereas stopping it is a whole other issue because um, there's a uh, chapter, uh, there's a paragraph in there called Tortious Interference in Respect of Economic Advantage. And if, uh, if you do that, you have one problem. And if you do it, um, if you do a conspiracy to do that, is an even bigger problem. Now, you know, the, uh, these laws are generally good things. You don't want price fixing, you don't want vertically integrated combines deciding who can and can't enter the market and so forth. There, there's plenty of good that gets done. Um, but ultimately, if I make available a method by which a whole bunch of people who make money by receiving email will agree to follow my directions by excluding other people from the email market, then we are all liable as hell for the Sherman Antitrust. And uh, you can beat it. You can beat the lawsuit. You can explain why it doesn't apply. You could even potentially set a precedent that would maybe clean up the language to make this kind of civil protest uh, available. But if you want to beat it, then you have to be able to stay in in a lawsuit against uh, what is now called Experian, what was then called TRW, and they had just bought a uh, bulk commercial email sending company. And that bulk email sending company didn't want to do what they called double opt-in, which I simply called verified opt-in, that they insisted it was opting in twice and therefore unreasonable. They didn't want to do that. And uh, when we listed them, their parent company, no, they were on the list after, and then they got bought, and then TRW found out there's a problem. And TRW has more lawyers than most people have uh, spoons. Uh, they, it's experience now, and I just have to say, you don't want to be in a lawsuit with somebody who can bury you in discovery to the point where you would have to spend $20,000 a day in legal expenses for a period of years. It's like trying to sue a tobacco company. You just can't win. It doesn't matter what the principles are, it doesn't matter what the Constitution says, and it certainly doesn't matter what the intent of the law was. Sending spam is not illegal, stopping it is prospectively illegal until you can stand in against a behemoth long enough to prove that it's not, at which point a different behemoth is just going to come out of the report and start the whole process over again. So, 
Uh, this is an example of me learning things the hard way. So what ended up happening with that first company? The question is, what ended up happening? The question is, what ended up happening with maps? Where you swapped the labels? Eventually, um, my lawyers said that uh, defending me was evidently costing more than I could afford, and that they would only continue if I signed a personal guarantee uh, to the tune of their legal fees. Um, and since losing the court battle at that time would be more expensive than I could afford, it was a, kind of a, a no-brainer. I had to sign the, the thing anyway. So a few months later, he said, you know, it's, it's like you owe me more than one and a half million dollars. And uh, I tried to explain to the partners why we should cut that. And we're willing to cut some, but you got to pay. And, uh, you know, you can... You can do that kind of thing when the NASDAQ's at 5,000 and you're an owner of a whole bunch of shares of various uh, dot-coms. Once the dot-com landscape started to fall apart in 2000 2001 or so, I could no longer afford to do that. And the lawyer said, it is with great reluctance that I am going to put a lien on your house and put your family out on the street. Um, at which point we said, hmm, perhaps selling this company and using the proceeds to pay our lawyers is actually the best thing to do. And that is how Trend Micro ended up on in mass. <laughs> well, so, yeah. It sounds like you're suggesting that never go against Goliath. Um, are there any fights worth fighting in today's internet political climate? The question is, are there fights worth fighting? Um, I think once you get to the point where you're signing a personal guarantee, you should get your wife's permission before you do it. <laughs> uh, I think if you're going to do something today that's going to cause one of these personal guarantees to come at you, uh, you should do enough research to know that that's going to happen and talk to your wife before you do whatever that was. Um, and, you know, if, if that's how you want to be known, if you're willing to live in the street and have your children uh, live there with you, uh, as a matter of principle, then, you know, God love you, I don't hate spam that much. <laughs> so, there was a smarter way to do this uh, that wouldn't have attracted lawsuits, that would have had more of a lasting impact. Uh, and I will certainly point at Steve over at Spam House, who is still doing it. You know, the, it's, they have a uh, Roxo, they have an SPL, they have all kinds of ways that they make spammers and the ISPs who are friendly to spammers uh, live in pain. And uh, I don't think they're going to stop spam any more than I was going to stop spam, but at least they're doing something that isn't causing them to well, see who lives on a houseboat in the supply. Um, but uh, there are probably countries you can't travel to at this point. Um, so, fights worth fighting. Um, what I learned from MAPS was not so much don't take risks, it was uh, you look at ISC as one example of a nonprofit that I started, you look at MAPS as another example, you say one is having a lasting, gigantic impact on human history, and the other one is a flash in the pan. The characteristic difference between them is that one of them was trying to make something possible. And the other one was trying to make something not possible. So, the lesson I took is build roads, don't build walls. Our last round. Our, our last section is called Speed Round, which is random questions for Paul Dixie. Um, really, when I went to our DNS team at Cloudflare, they were dying to know what pizza uh, you preferred, um, but I want to ask you that. Um, first question is, I grew up in this town, and uh, there is a pizzeria called Piro's on um, 37th and Terraville. That uh, if you order the Piro special, you will not be disappointed. It's changed owners four or five times since I lived there, but yeah, they've still got the same sauce, the same same crust. Go there. The Cloud Third DNS team is all here, and thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first question is: What is the worst job you you've ever had? I took a job uh, 
writing software for an IBM PC that involved uh, building screens in uh, what was called Visual C at the time, but Windows didn't exist yet, so you can imagine what it was. Uh, and I lasted only a few hours. <laughs> it out, I didn't like food that much. <laughs> uh, what is the funniest thing you've done with DNS? I added something called uh, round robin uh, to give sort of statistical load balancing. So if you had a resource record set that had five or six MXs or five or six A records, uh, or whatever quad is at the time, um, it would just rotate by one every time it was used. Um, and this meant that the other ones would at least have some chance of getting access, because otherwise, get, get host by name is going to return them in DNS order, and then I'm going to try the first one, and if it works, they'll never try the rest. I got two calls. One was from somebody at Berkeley, uh, who did not remember that Bind had come from there, and was just asking me to fix this. And uh, <laughs> what do you mean fix it? Well, I've got two name servers uh, listed for whatever it was, some subdomain.berkeley.edu, and uh, the first one works and the second one doesn't. And until, uh, until now, that hasn't hurt us because the second one was never used. I said, well, why don't you just take the second one out? I said, well, I can't get permission to edit the thing or for some reason I can't do that. So I need you to please retract the feature you just put in the mind to get everybody in the world to install <laughs> the, the new version that won't try my second name server. I said, no. Uh, the second thing that happened was a um, call from TGV. TGV was two guys in a vax, and then it was three guys in a vax, and then the name of one would fit. They were making software uh, in the technet market uh, that would do telnet, where other people were doing LACP or LAT or whatever. Um, and they had a full TCP IP stack for DOS and for the VMS and who knows what else. Um, and they said, uh, we need you to take that, that feature back out. Uh, we need at least text record sets. You know, we need to have them be sta stable. Uh, why? Well, because in, the, in our implementation, if you hit the question mark, it will you know, do a text record lookup, and it'll get all of the text that goes with the host you're thinking you might want to connect to, and we'll print that on your screen. And it will usually be some kind of informational a uh, description of the, the server that you're thinking about attaching yourself to. And um, I said, well, that seemed, you know, there's a whole other way you could do this. And I explained what the other way was. And uh, I said, yeah, well, we don't want to do that. We just like it. it, 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 it tell me more. And uh, I said, well, we don't use this feature in the normal way here at TGV. It, it, they were Santa Cruz company. Um, they later got bought by Cisco. And uh, so, you know, we, we all know what the servers are, so we don't use this to indicate which server it is or what file systems it has or anything like that. Uh, we have typed in the entire text of the poem Jabberwocky, and we have assigned a paragraph of the poem to each host, and we're scrambling it. And I said, how exactly can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> You asked. Uh, how many domain names do you own? Uh, probably around 20. Um, you know, and most of them are just stupid stuff that uh, are probably going to expire because I, I will eventually get tired of paying for them without using them. What's the dumbest one? The dumbest one? <laughs> Um, probably AL.org was the Atlantean League. There's a double entendre there in case you didn't catch it. Uh, I just wanted a, a vanity domain that I could use for email and not have to worry about which company I worked for and so on. I later just used redbarn.org and never really used this for its intended purpose. but. Uh, the state of Alabama and a whole bunch of other people who call themselves AL have each asked me to gift or, or sell the name to them over time. Uh, it really occurs to me that if I didn't have it, then I wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's exactly, oh, yeah. You're going to buy more cars? 
The question um, is, will you buy more cars? No, no I have other cars. <laughs> I, am, I need to sell some cars so that I can buy parts for the other cars. <laughs> <laughs> What's the coolest takedown your data has helped? What's the coolest takedown that from malware or something that, that your data has been involved in? The question is, what is the coolest data that, uh, the coolest takedown that your data has been like attributed to or has helped takedown? Well, I don't myself have data. Uh, what I do is facilitate the exchange of data between various cooperating parties. Um, and in terms of data which has passed through my hands that got where it was going because of my stubbornness, uh, the coolest thing I have been involved in was DNS changer didn't take downs. Um, uh, six Estonians and a Russian decided to rent time on the Illyrian.net, uh, not for the purpose of DDoSing for hire or spamming or anything else, but simply for the purpose of reconfiguring the DNS registry for the local Windows machine and also reaching out to the local small plastic DSL box or wire Wi-Fi gateway using the standard passwords and scripting its menu system to change its idea of what is the DNS server as well. And they just repointed the DNS uh, recursive server address for about 600,000 victims to point at their name servers instead of at whatever the ISP's name server was. And you'd think that they would have done that so that they could, I don't know, uh, catch you looking up you know, bankofwhatever.com and uh, punch you at their web server that would then steal your credentials or something. They didn't do any of that. Uh, all they did was they got in the middle of doubleclick.net and a whole bunch of other advertising domains that were used to carry ads. And they had it be that if anybody tried to fetch an ad using any of the domains that they were intercepting, then the ad that they would get would be an ad from their own data center instead of whatever the real ad was. Um, and so then once they had 600,000 customers using their ad servers for everything they serve, surfed on the internet, uh, they went into the ad business. And by the time the FBI and various other uh, law enforcement agencies <coughs> caught up, the forensics accountants were able to find 25 million euros of uh, stolen money. Now it's difficult to figure out who has standing to complain. You know, was it the advertiser? Anyway, we eventually, I guess, got them under the computer fraud and abuse thing because reconfiguring somebody's DNS service was the actual crime, not not the money. <coughs> the money was two uh, two vectors away. Um, however, when it was time to take this thing down. Uh, there was the problem of, you know, if, if we take, if we, we know where the guys are, we know where their equipment is, we're fixing to arrest them, we've got the van gassed up and ready to go. But if we do that and we, you know, put all their equipment in the truck and take it down to the warehouse where they can you know, have the hard drives and down, 600,000 people are going to go dark and they're going to call their ISP. And then the ISP is going to call the FBI and say, what have you done to us? Um, so the FBI went to the, the case lawyer who went to the judge and said, if we can find a suitable expert that is willing to uh, build replacement DNS servers uh, so that when we take the, the thing down, we'll do it carefully in the middle of the night so that very few people are using it. And by the time those people wake up, they'll have replacement DNS servers to talk to at the addresses belonging to the bad guys, because we're going to seize those addresses, because we're going to seize the company and the assets, which means that we get their addresses. And uh, the judge said, never heard anything like it, but go ahead and do it. So I got the call, huge honor. Um, and I, even though I was the chairman and chief scientist and probably should have delegated it, I didn't. Frank has its privileges. I got on the airplane and did the thing. I, I set up observers. I, was there when the FBI took their stuff down. I brought the servers up, I monitored them, I got everything working right. I sent a summary to the judge every month for a few months. We had to extend it for six months because we couldn't remediate fast enough. We had about 400,000 victims and it's not good enough. Um, but importantly, those servers had telemetry. We were watching uh, below the recursive, which I never do. At Farsight, we never look below the recursive. I don't want to know any PII. I never want to know the, 
person who made a lookup. I just want to know the response that came back as a result of the lookup. Uh, but for this, we had to. We had to know who the victims were. And uh, so I decided we were only going to collect the IP address, the time, and the port number, because that was enough to identify the, the NAT relationship inside some ISP. Given that information, an ISP can figure out who made that query, but I didn't save the query itself. I didn't, the, the, the Q name, the Q type, the rest of it is to me uh, potentially uh, radioactive. Right? What if it's a well known child abuse materials domain name? Do I have a responsibility to disclose? Well, I, it's not that I love people who abuse children, but I didn't want to have anyone answer that question. I also didn't want the FBI to have to answer that question. So we were very careful about which parts of the packet we wrapped. We made that data available through the Security Information Exchange, which is another part of my day job, free of charge to all of the remediators that includes um, Shadow Server, Team Comrie, all of the ISPs who had affected customers. We made it available in real time, no embargo, no fee, no nothing. And uh, you know, it took eight months, but we eventually got it down to a small enough population of people who were still sending queries to the old addresses that uh, we were willing to just let the old addresses go, 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 go fallow. Um, now those addresses have since been reallocated. Some came from Ripe, some came from Aaron. Uh, Aaron put their address space in permanent abeyance and said, you know, this, is, this stuff is bad, we don't want anybody to get it. Ripe reallocated their portion of this criminal address space. And so whoever has that space now is getting a lot of DNS queries. And I fear for the loss of privacy by those people if the queries are received by somebody less ethical than myself. But in any case, that is the coolest takedown that I've ever been associated with. Uh, Paul, you are awesome. Um, Omar was going to come in and wrap up and ask you the last few questions. Well, actually, a lot of them already got um, answered. Um, the reason why we thought about this uh, meetup was to surface more talks about DNS. Um, obviously, it's something that um, is you know, the foundation of the internet, and usually people don't even know who the hell is. Um, and that causes problems for companies that work with DNS, uh, like us, Cloudflare, um, and you know, just on daily basis, you can you can um, talk about it. There's so many people that have websites. Um, so that's this was this was kind of a, a way to talk about the history, the um, uh, large contributors uh, to DNS, and then the second series. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk about things more generally, um, and then hopefully we can get into a series where it's more uh, technical. So if you guys have any ideas, um, if you have friends, um, bosses, um, or people that you know would be good contributors to this meetup, that would be great. Please send them along uh, to either me, which I, to either me, lobster at gun.net, or danny at cloudflare.com. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Um, here's a little gift as a token. It's called the calling with Pinot Noir from Russian River. Wow. And thanks for accepting our call. <laughs> Thank you very much.